Let's turn our hymnals to page 376. What a wonderful Savior. 376. Sing from your heart. Give us a good day. Bless this time as we share together. 
Bless your words as shared this morning, and bless the music as we sing our song of praise to you. Bless this time, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome into the Lord's house. It is good to have each one here. We want to pause and welcome our guests. If you're visiting, would you raise your hand? Do we have any visitors? Good to have each one here. We're glad to have you all here. Good to, good to be together, and we just ask the Lord to bless our time as we share together. I uh, quickly want to share a few announcements. First of all, uh, words of praise and thanks uh, for those who were able to be here last evening for Mom's Night Out, I think you, uh, or, or Ladies' Night Out, I think you uh, got a, a true blessing, and uh, first thank Barbara for organizing it, and those who uh, prepared food and helped to serve it and to make it a great night, but especially for the ladies who were able to be here and to enjoy the time together. Uh, it was a good time, I believe, um, for all. <clears throat> and then speaking of eating, we had a uh, good breakfast this morning, didn't we? Amen. Did everybody enjoy it? Yes. And yeah, Carla uh, is, is operating one arm now, but uh, she still managed to organize that and to pull it off and to make it a great event. So thank you, Carla, for all that you did. And again, for all those who, who brought food and contributed and helped and and for all that you did, thank you for, uh, for making it a great event. And uh, if we're going to continue talking about eating, we'll just look down through the, uh, the list of things upcoming. Uh, in two weeks, the youth are going to be doing a, a pork barbecue lunch, carry-out lunch. So uh, put that on your, your uh, agenda and remember that in two weeks, we want to support the youth and, and uh, get a pork barbecue uh, sandwich from them. Or I think it's actually a dinner. Uh, for carry out. And then on the 31st, the book club will be meeting, and guess what they are going to be doing? They're going out to eat at Janet Shanks. So we enjoy eating, don't we? Unfortunately, on last night, it shows that. Pardon? Got to do it anyway. There you go. There you go. And especially we enjoy eating together. And that's right. Enjoying the fellowship. I like to think, at least, that the fellowship is worth more than the food, but boy, the food's awful good. Praise the Lord. So let's go on to other things uh, other than the eating. Uh, this afternoon, Pastor Scott will be out at Timberview at 3 for a message out there. Uh, know that the folks out there will enjoy it. And if you're able to go out and support that and visit, uh, you can feel welcome to do that. Uh, tomorrow evening, don't forget the Bible study out at the Gallows. Uh, that will be at 7 p.m. Uh, Wednesday evening, or excuse me, Wednesday morning, the Town and Country Bible Study out in Broadway. Uh, Thursday evening, the uh, Facebook Live online Bible study. Uh, the closed bank will be. Uh, let me get my place. The closed bank will be here Thursday evening, and also I skipped over the youth Bible study Thursday evening as well. Uh, very busy week, so make note of, of all those things that are are coming up and uh, participate wherever you can. Uh, also, I found a note, or, or David gave you a note that he found, that says the Crestman will be here with special guest Dwight Martin at Folks Run Elementary on May the 21st. That will be Saturday in two weeks, I think. Uh, Crestman and Dwight Martin, uh, they'll be at 4.30, the doors open, music starts at 5, and hey, back to eating, there's a cake auction at 7. <coughs> Uh, and the benefits, uh, the proceeds benefit the Broadway Emergency Squad and Burton Branch. So support that if you can. Does anyone have other announcements they'd like to share at this time? All right, let's take just a moment and welcome one another and say Happy Mother's Day to the ladies around you. And uh, then we'll move on with our course. His name is Wonder.
Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again this morning. We would ask that you would bless everybody here. Bless those that have to give and bless those that do not. And Lord, just bless those who are missing, whatever the reason may be, and lead them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to thee and go out and tell others about thee. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
enjoying that love and mercy. We ask, Lord, you would be with our mothers today and with those ladies, Lord, that surround us, that are motherly. We love them. We love our young girls who perhaps aspire to one day be a mother. We ask, God, that your hand would be on us for you invented motherhood. It was not something that we came up with, nor was it something that we just backed into because of nature. You invented it. And I pray, God, for each of these moms that you have ordained should be in our lives to give us the counsel and the love that we so needed. We ask, God, your hand upon our families, upon our church. We have loved ones that are in the hospital, loved ones that are going to go into the hospital, and we need your help for them and your mercy, Lord, upon them. Be with those, Lord, who are struggling with health issues right now, and they don't know exactly what is going to happen to them, but, Lord, they need you. Not just peace, not just a sense of your Spirit's presence, but they need a healing touch as well. And we ask, God, for your hand in them. We ask, Lord, for those that are struggling with relationship issues today, may, may even be some mothers here today, that feel that their relationships with their children have been strained, or perhaps even broken. And I pray, God, that you would give wisdom and begin the mending process even today. I pray, Father, that you would be with those that are in need financially, looking for occupation, looking for job, maybe needing a raise. I pray, God, that you would grant them grace. I pray, Lord, for those that are in the emergency services, that you would help them, Lord, with all that they do, with all that they give us. We ask, Lord, for your special blessings upon them and for our military as well. We ask, Lord, that you would help as the gospel goes forward. I pray, Father, that missionaries would be blessed of you, that the right people would go into missions, and that you would send the right people into missions. I pray, Lord, for our pulpits this morning in this community, that, Lord, you would place godly men in these pulpits that will proclaim unabashedly and without fear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, we ask that you would commit this service into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Trying a little something new today. You probably saw the, the uh, pulpit was moved. But uh, I want to talk to you today about mothers. I'm not sure if my position is going to be good for the clicker. And that looks like I found a spot. But um, some of you know that it's uh, two years now since my own mother passed. And um, I'll remember it. You know, of course, just like all of you remember the days that your mom's passed. You remember how you found out. Uh, for me, it was Easter. Uh, I think it was Easter that year. Or it was the 19th. I know that. But I don't know if it was Easter. But uh, it was the 19th of April. We had just finished the, uh, it was during COVID, and we had just finished our Facebook Live. And uh, we were getting things put together afterwards, and I checked my messages, and I knew that my mom's life was in danger. And when I saw a message from my sister, I asked the folks that were here helping me with the service, I asked them if they would just stay for a little bit, and I made the phone call. And my sister told me that my mom had passed. And you know that that's very hard. Any of you who have lost your mother, you know how hard that news is, and you know how it hits you between the eyes. And uh, when I was a kid and I went off to college, my mom and dad lived in Anchorage still. And I went to college in Marion, Indiana, and, and 
you get, for those of you that don't remember, there was a day when you did not have cell phones. <coughs> okay, there was a day when if you made a call to home, it had to be uh, either a call that you paid seven cents a minute for, or sometimes more than that if you were in the wrong time of the day. It could become as much as 42 cents a minute for a phone call. And then, uh, if you were me, in college, it had to be a collect call. Now, some of us had this routine, right, that when you would call collect, they would say, uh, collect call from Scott, buddy, will you accept the charges? And my mom and dad would say no. And then they knew what number to call, and they would call directly so that we could at least avoid the added charges of a collect call. Anybody here ever do that one before? Okay, we see a few people that have some hands up there. They, they, know, they knew the trick. Okay. My mom is sending me off from Anchorage to Marion, Indiana. That's a long distance. I'm not going to see her during the year. I'm somewhere close to my aunt and somewhere close to some old friends from Fort Wayne but not anywhere where my mom is going to be able to talk to me. So, as a quiet present, one that she gave me with her own hands, she slipped this little booklet into my hands, and I've kept it ever since. It says, things your mother always told you, but you didn't want to hear. <laughs> so, as I open it, up, open it up to the first page, I read in my mother's own handwriting to Scott, I hope you enjoy this little book and remember all these neat sayings. Mostly I pray God's very best for you. Love, Mama. It's just a very sweet thing to be able to see that in her handwriting still today. I want to read you a couple of these little sayings that she put in this book. Well, she didn't write it, she bought it, but it's handwritten. It's kind of an odd book, but she must have gotten it in the bookstore or something. The really happy man is the one who can enjoy the scenery even when he has to take a detour. Well, that's a pretty nice, and I usually do enjoy the detours. Always wear clean underwear. Heaven forbid you should have an accident. <laughs> that's good advice. I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Now, you're asking who picked these out. It's my wife, because I noted to my wife, I said, you remind me a lot of my mom, so you pick out a few things that you think are cool, and it will probably be the same ones my mom would have thought was cool. I did not pick the clean underwear one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> well, you, you read it to me, and I said, that's funny, put that one in there. <laughs> if you lie down with dogs, you'll get up with fleas. Yes, that's one of the things you need to remember. Hey! <laughs> Being a Christian is a journey, not a destination. Some nice little sayings there in this book that my mom gave me. I want to talk to you today about our mothers. They are our counselors. <coughs> and I want us to get a feel for how this happened by actually going all the way back to the beginning when God created mothers. Okay? Um, the, mothers were not something that we just kind of came up with out of necessity. God had a creation uh, story so that we would understand where they came from. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read just a, a few verses, a couple of verses there, 21 and 22. Uh, we're going to pretty much omit the rest of the creation story, and this is on purpose so that we save time and so that we narrow ourselves down to this particular subject of mothers. So I want to be sure that you're not thinking, you know, well, why doesn't he read more context? There's more to the story than that. I, I want you to understand I understand that. There's a lot more to the story. But this is about mothers, okay? 
verses 21 and 22. So, the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Isn't that beautiful? Now, there's some implications of that that we're going to talk about as we go through this morning. But I want us to understand what God is doing here. Okay? He is creating woman in such a way that she is a literal part of the man in the beginning. I understand as time goes on, you're not missing a rib, you know, you, when you get a wife, they don't take a rib out of you and make a new woman, okay? Uh, it happened once. It only needed to happen once. There's a reason for that, and we'll see that in this message today, okay? He took the rib from the man so that the man would not be complete without his wife, okay? I... <laughs> Men, you need to understand that part. But women, you need to understand that part. Okay? There's a line from a movie, and I know the name of the movie, but I don't want to advertise the movie. But there's a line from a movie where it, it, it's at the most romantic part of the film. The main character of the film says to the woman that he loves, he says the words, you complete me. Okay. Now, I understand that there's a theological aspect to that to which we might say, no, uh, no woman is supposed to complete you, no man is supposed to complete you, only Christ is supposed to complete you. I understand there's a theological aspect to that. Okay, but if you, if you don't mind, I'm going to step down a little bit from theology. And I'm going to say that God intended it to be this way that a husband and wife would not be complete without each other. Which is why the, the current trend of living together is so bad. Because when you're living together, you're not man and wife. You're not in a covenant relationship. You're just in some kind of a verbal agreement. And when one of you gets upset, the other one can just... <laughs> and you just split up and you move on. But what you have done is, with the exception of the covenant, you have completed each other without a commitment, and then when you split up, it still tears you to pieces. It fractures you. And if you're a woman that's living with a man, and that man leaves, and then you begin to live with another man, you have now fractures of you that have been deposited into other people's lives. And you can never get those fractures back. And it's vice versa with the men. If you practice living with women, or even just engaging in casual relationships, you're fracturing your personality into little slivers and all of those fractures dwell in each of those women that you were with. And it's going to make it harder and harder to be complete in a marriage relationship. And so we need to be careful about that. Because God has an intention for what he created at the beginning of time. And that intention is that the man should not be alone and that the woman should be made out of part of the man so that he would call her, as it says in verse 23, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. And there would be a, a relationship there that would be wonderful and complete 
in and of itself. Now, if I can find my happy spot over here, we can get the first line up. A wife is a personal creation. We've already talked about this to an extent. Let's look at the scripture that we have as, as a proof text. Looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Every feminist's favorite chapter. I'm being facetious, of course. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image of the glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from the woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now, again, remember that God said, man should not be alone. And then remember that God created a woman out of the man to be with the man, and in, created her, in a sense, as the glory of the man. Now, this is not humanism, and this is not feminism that we're talking about here. Okay, and in fact, what we're talking about here in terms of, of the humanist, feminist part of, of life uh, is really something that is contained in the curse. It's, it's against motherhood. It's against uh, the intention of the woman. And so when you follow humanism and you follow feminism to its ultimate end, it breaks up the family. It, it doesn't unite the family, it breaks up the family. And its intention is to break up the family. It's to divide the woman and the man over the idea of fairness and unfairness, of respect and disrespect and, and such things. Such things that are very personal to us. And God has created the woman specifically for the sake of the man. This is what the scripture is telling us. Okay, so we either have a biblical approach or we have a humanist approach. And um, I'm going to just leave it there because I, I can't resolve that in one sermon. I know there's something in the sweet spot. Found it before. There it is. A wife is created to be loved. Okay, listen. There are fellows out there that frankly just don't love their wives. That's just all there is to it. They love themselves. They don't love their wives. I want us to take a look at a book that we rarely access because it is, to a degree, kind of confusing, but there is, a, there is something there that I thought we could uh, bring to light in the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. Uh, the older English Bible called it the Canticle of Canticles. Now that's quite an old English word, isn't it? Instead of song, a canticle. But uh, nevertheless, in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 15, um, or Song of Songs, depending on how your Bible denotes it. <clears throat> now this is, uh, just so that you understand, uh, this is the, uh, the woman talking about her beloved, her man. Now a lot of folks say that the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, is a reflection on the relationship between uh, Jesus and the church. It could also be said in context that it's a celebration between God and his people. But um, Jesus and his church is what a lot of theologians go with, and I'm going to have to go with them on this one. Let's take a look. Uh, verses 8 through 15. Okay? Listen, my beloved, look. Here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, 
gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the, co the cooing of doves is heard in our land, the fig tree forms its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. My dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places, this is the, the man talking, I guess, at this point. My dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountain, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Now, I want to ask you a question. When is it the last time that you leapt over the hills and bounded over the mountains just to see your wife? When is the last time that you got up in the middle of the night and you said to your wife, let's go outside, let's, let's walk through the garden before the sun comes up, let's smell all of the flowers, let's listen to the cooing of the morning doves, let's, let's just be the two of us in the quiet of the day. That, how long has it been? I want you to look at the passion of the love of Christ for his church. He wants to love you passionately. He comes leaping and bounding over the mountains to love you, Christian. <coughs> he invites you out into the morning air before the day is busy, before everything begins to start. And he says to you, I want to show you my creation. I want you to smell the flowers I made. I want you to hear the birds I made. I want you to watch the sun rise with me. Christ loves you. And he made a woman for Adam, and that woman was supposed to be loved. No, it doesn't always work out that way in this life. Yes, maybe I'm speaking in terms of ideals and not reals. But I'm telling you that the reason we have the reals and not the ideals is because we are corrupted and we're not dissatisfied with corruption. We're actually satisfied with corruption. We've come to say to ourselves, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always going to be. I need to stop dreaming. I need to stop wishing. I need to stop thinking. Yes, in a sense, don't wish, don't dream. Okay? Do. Don't wish, don't dream, just do. If you're supposed to love your wife, then love your wife. And if God made you for your husband, be for your husband. Don't fight against him. Don't say to him, well, yeah, but you have your life and I have my life. No, the two of you are supposed to be a unit. You're supposed to be one flesh. And there's a means in which here that, that we really kind of have to fight because the world is not willing to fight for us. The world wants to strip us apart. The world wants more single women and more single men. The world wants more broken homes. The world wants uh, all of our foundations and all of our underpinnings gone. And then we see here from the original text that the reason that she is there is to be and help me for him. God created the woman to be a helper for her husband. Eve was created for Adam to help him. Okay, to help him do what? To help him have a video game room in his basement so that he can go down there and never be seen again? No, absolutely not. To help him do what? You know, to help him help him go out and hunt all the time so that he's out of the house and you don't have to deal with him? 
No. To help him be the man that Christ is making him to be. My mother was a great counselor. Everything that she ever told me and everything she ever said to me was in reference and in context of what my dad had said. I don't remember a time in my entire life that my mom ever said to me, I know that's what your dad said, but it's okay. I know that's what your dad said, but my mom never in my entire memory contradicted my father. And every time I had a problem and every time I was going through something, my mom would quote the Bible. And my grandmother, her mom, who lived with us for much of my childhood, she would do the same thing, always quoting the Bible, always singing Bible songs, always pointing me back to Jesus, pointing me back to Jesus. The woman's name is Eve. That name is significant because as it says in Genesis uh, 3.20, which is not chapter 2, of course, but 3.20, he called her Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. So this is what the word Eve means, mother. Adam named her Eve on purpose. He wasn't just her wife, he was, she was the mother of all the living. And here, I want us to take a look at Proverbs 14.1. If you're in Song of Songs already, why well, Proverbs isn't too far away, just go back a little. Big number 14, little number 1. It says this simply, the wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. The mother is the counsel of the children. If the mother counsels her children correctly, she will build up her own household. If she is wise, if she remembers that while she may have other aspirations and other ideas about what femininity ought to be and all of this, even if she has all those other ideas, if she will commit to what the scripture tells her is the reality rather than chasing after some other invention and she's wise with her children she will bring up godly children but the bible says if a woman follows her own heart which the scripture says is a foolish thing to do she will tear apart her family because she will be drawing away the children from God, or even from husband, over to herself. And with that foolishness, she tears down her house. You see, I have come across people in the past who have destroyed their own homes by their own counsel. I sat behind somebody at a, at a movie and the hero, one of the heroes, went back, they were running away from danger and a child or somebody was, was injured and was crying out for help and one of the heroes turned around and went back, saved the child but then got killed in the process. And a mother sitting in front of me with her child, about nine, 10 years old child, said, you see, that was a weakness right there. She shouldn't have gone back for, the, for that person. That's counsel from mom to kid. 
It's a weakness to be a hero. It's a weakness to save other people. It's a weakness to put yourself in danger for the sake of some other person. Save yourself. Save yourself. What foolish counsel. It's no wonder that for years our military one of the strengths of our military has been its commitment to Christianity as one of the major, if not the major, faith allowed in the military through the chaplain program. Now, they try to honor other religions, but it was so much so that um, Jewish uh, films back in the 60s were warning Jewish people that if they went into the military, they would be recruited into Christianity. Um, that's how that's how much of a uh, of a culture Christianity has had in our military. It is because of that Christianity that they say things like there's no atheists in foxholes, right? You've heard that, that saying. Christianity has had a big effect. These boys that went into war and faced unmentionable horror so that they could protect our country and would often go into the line of fire to drag a wounded brother in arms out of the way of harm, were raised by mothers that counseled them with wisdom. Not by mothers that said things like, save yourself. You're more important than anybody else. Nobody will look out for you. Look out for yourself. What foolishness. Well, oh, come on now. Don't do that to me. A mother raises men. Back to the uh, feminist chapter of 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. Look at what it says in verses 11 and 12 here. In verses 11 and 12 we read, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. You notice the scripture is not making a distinction here, but it is calling the boys that are born to the women men. That's not an accident. Mamas, you don't raise boys. Mamas, you raise men. They are going to be men three-fourths to four-fifths of their life. If you raise boys, they will never be able to hold a job. They will always be coming home looking for you to shelter them. And they will never, ever be able to hold their own in the face of adversity in this life. Mamas don't raise boys, raise men. Keep it in mind, they are men. They may be boys right now, but they will be men <coughs> unless something tragic should happen, but they will be men eventually. And we need to keep that in mind. We also need to keep in mind that a mother raises women. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. Paul admonishes Timothy here. 
if I can get the pages to open properly. I have those really thin pages that like to stick to each other. Chapter 3, verse 11. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Here, Paul gives women specific things that they are to teach their daughters. To be worthy of respect. Now that's an important thing, and I think everyone wants their daughters to be worthy of respect. But we have different ideas of what respect means for girls these days. We have taken what men call respect for each other, and we have translated that into the only kind of respect that there is. Okay? Men do not respect women today the way that the Bible intends for women to be respected. Women are to be respected as sacrosanct. In other words, they are to be set apart. They are to be not touched, not, uh, not violated, until such a time as there is a covenant of marriage for a lifetime. Now that is the scripture. I'm not saying that there's not all kinds of aberrations today. There are all kinds of problems, all kinds of messes, okay? But you don't have to be involved in the messes just because there are messes. And if you have been involved in the mess, you don't have to continue to be involved in the mess. You can stop being messy. Bring your women up to be worthy of respect, the kind of respect where Paul says to Timothy, Treat the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters. It should be that kind of respect. And it gives us another thing here, uh, not to be malicious talkers. In other words, gossips. Don't be gossips. Okay? And then it says to be temperate. That means uh, don't be emotional is what temperate means. Teach your daughters not to be emotional. Um, Men have emotions, but men have a tendency to clamp down on them. And we do that out of necessity and out of nature. Women, on the other hand, and I don't mean this as, a, as an affront, please don't take it wrong. It's just that women are more naturally given to their emotions. Okay, that's the nature that God made them. That's what makes you a good counselor for your kids. Because when your kids are emotional, mom understands. Dad says, hey, buck up. Hey, come on. Come on. Get, you're okay. You're okay. Knock it off. That's dad. Okay? Mom is, oh, my baby, my baby, you're hurt. Oh, come here. And let me wipe this off and let me clean this up and let me, let, come here and let me give you kisses. There is nothing like a mom that understands your emotions. Don't be, don't be upset. Don't be surprised by the fact that it's nature. For you to have emotions, Mama. And it's a good thing, but you need to be temperate. Okay? I have seen people where their kid falls down and bumps their knee, and you would think that a shark just ate their child right in front of them. <laughs> and it makes the child even worse because the child who had a bumped knee now thinks that he's got a shark eating him. <laughs> and so he freaks out even worse. And it just makes the situation horrible. So this is what Paul is talking about when he says be, to, that, that women should teach their young women to be temperate. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean not to get drunk or whatever, but that would be a good one to throw in. And then he says, trustworthy in everything. I could have trusted my mom with anything. I, she would never have disappointed me. I, she couldn't trust me. There were some times where she just, she wanted to trust me, but she, that was her bad, you know? <laughs> because 
I wasn't setting out to be trustworthy at the time. Well, unfortunately, uh, while children may not be trustworthy yet because they are children, women had ought to be, and men had ought to be. And we need to keep in mind, moms, that we're not raising little girls. We're raising men, uh, women, okay? Let's see if I can find my spot again. There we go. Okay, now, why was Adam created and Eve created the way that they were? So that we would understand Christ and the church. Ephesians 5 is very clear on that. Okay, the creation happened the way it happened so that we would understand Christ in the church. And we see God in Eden piercing the side of, of Adam and taking a rib. But instead we see on the cross God piercing through the spear of the soldier piercing the side of Christ and blood and water flows from there instead of a rib. And Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The scripture shows us that there was a reason that Eve was created the way she was, so that she would be flesh of Adam's flesh and bone of Adam's bone. But Jesus has created the church so that we would be spirit of his spirit. Do you see this? Among men, there was found no helpmeet for Christ. So Christ purified for himself a bride so that he could have a holy helpmeet. One that, like Adam said to Eve, was bone and flesh of his we are now of Christ's spirit of his spirit. And we have a mother now that the scripture calls the New Jerusalem. This New Jerusalem is our counselor. She is our mother as it says in Galatians 4 and uh, verses 26 to 28. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who never were in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of she who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. So we, like Isaac, are children of promise. And our mother, the new Jerusalem, is like Sarah. And our Christ is like Abraham. Until the day of the cross, until the day that Jesus died for you and I, there was not found among all of humankind a suitable help me for Jesus. So Jesus purified in the cross all those who believed in him from the beginning looking toward the cross and all of us who have believed in him from this point looking back on the cross and what was accomplished there and those who are yet to come. 
and we have a new mother, this new Jerusalem. And of the new Jerusalem, we have from her the counsel of Scripture. And this counsel raises men and women. Let's take a look at what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Looking at verses uh, 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Here we see in the scripture the basis of our mother, the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is built on scripture. It is not built on scripture plus whatever wisdom you bring to the table. It's wisdom beyond wisdom. It is knowledge beyond knowledge. Our mother, the New Jerusalem, is our counselor. Our Jesus was pierced in his side that blood and water might flow forth for our cleansing. As Adam of old was pierced that he might have a wife, Jesus was pierced that he might have a bride. And we celebrate mothers today, not just simply because you happen to be female. We celebrate mothers because you are a particular creation a peculiar creation <laughs> made in a way and a form that most people don't want to acknowledge. But the scripture has put you into a context, a unique context, one that men can never be. You are our counselors. And I pray that wherever you happen to be right now in your walk with the Lord, you will embrace the scripture and begin to implement that into either your motherhood, your grandmotherhood, or your motherhood to be, wherever you happen to be, or maybe just in your mothering of other people's children. But we love you and we appreciate you and we thank God for you today. Let's go ahead and, and uh, it's 10 past, so let's skip the hymn, and we'll just go to the Mother's Day presentation, and we'll have John come up and help us with that. So, this is, uh, seems to be put on my back once again. It's so difficult to pick out because uh, as I look out, there's so many mothers out there that are deserving of our special prizes. First of all, I want to uh, thank a very special mother who helped to make all this possible, who uh, arranged uh, the roses, and also uh, thank Sue and Bobby for the, the hanging plants. But, Barbara is always, she doesn't like being recognized much, I don't think. She's, I don't want to embarrass her, but we really do love her and appreciate all that she does for us. And uh, it just seems like so little. We were talking before 
service. I mean, she had no idea I was going to put her on the spot here, and I apologize for that. But, you know, we, we think things that are special, and what do we do? I mean, the flowers are beautiful, but uh, we don't think ahead, you know, is there something else that we should be doing? So we have the flowers, and they are beautiful, and we appreciate them. But I want to share the first of the special flowers, the larger flowers, with Barbara, because she contributes so much uh, to our ministry. She's led our ministry commission, and you know, she's always there. With whatever holiday or season, she's always taking care of us and, and making our service special. So, Barbara, I want to recognize you with the first of these.
that point, we could always have somebody come up and grab a couple of hands. Yeah, it's a